Good morning, beloved. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We hope that you have a good week in the Lord coming up and take opportunities to share good news with others. There was an elementary age Sunday school class that was working hard at memorizing verses of scripture. And one little seven-year-old boy was really getting into the assignment, spending quite a bit of time at home doing his memory work for class. And his dad noticed this and asked the little guy about it. And he, he asked, um, you know, what, what prize or reward would, would he get if he learned all those verses? And his son uh, eyed him with that simple childlike look and said, we get to learn more. I hope that we all have that kind of attitude as we approach this book. We get to learn more. Now, I confess that I love this book. I don't worship this book. I worship the God of this book. To worship this book would be to make it an idol. I'm not promoting bibliolatry, but I do love the book, and I have devoted my life to learning it as best I can and to helping others learn it and to applying it and to help others apply it. It is an amazing book. It's a book of incredible variety. It's a book of awesome depth, yet it is a book of surprising simplicity. It's also a pretty big book, right? So I think it's helpful at times for us to see as much of the big picture of this book at once as we possibly can. And that's our purpose today. Our lesson is titled, The Bible in Three Chapters. So I hope in addition to this uh, teaching and and edifying you that you can use this broad outline to teach others. Maybe use it to teach your children. Maybe someone that you're reaching out to with the good news, whatever it might be. It's easy to remember. It is true to the book, and it uh, tells us the gospel story. It tells us the good news in a compelling way, I believe. You realize that you can teach, you can teach someone the gospel from the first three chapters of the Bible. Now, I'm not referring to uh, the the book of Matthew that opens the New Testament. You can certainly teach the good news from that book and should, but I'm talking about the the very first three chapters of the Bible of the Old Testament, Genesis 1 through 3. In fact, I'm really convinced that the foundation and the basis of effective gospel teaching in our current culture today is, is the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Maybe you haven't thought of that before, but I am convinced that that is true. Almost all the major doctrines or teachings of the Bible have their basis in these early chapters. Things like sin and uh, death and salvation and Satan and mankind. All these and others are covered initially in these early chapters. And so I want us to dial in to the first three chapters today as we look at this summary of the gospel. The first thing that I want us to note in Genesis chapter 1 is that God is the former. God is the former. You look for a moment with me at how the Bible begins. The opening verse is Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And so it goes on for six full days of creation. And we have the making of plants and sun and moon and stars and then sea life and then animals and finally mankind. Six full days. At the end of each, God pronounces what is made good. And then at the end of it all, in verse 31, sort of taking it all in, he pronounces it very good. So what does that tell us? Well, many things I'm sure, but basically it tells us that there was a time when there was nothing but God. And that he then spoke into existence everything we see and many things that we do not see with our physical eyes. He took that which was formless and created a form. He gave the shapeless a shape. He created ex nihilo, that is, out of nothing, everything that now is. God created all things. That is a crucial doctrine to believe in. That in the beginning, God, God is responsible for what we see. Not some blind, impersonal force, not evolutionary processes over millions of years, but God, in the beginning, he is the former. I think... We need to be diligent in teaching one another, and especially in teaching our young people this very doctrine. God created the world in six days. They're not going to learn it anyplace else anymore. Our world has largely rejected this idea foolishly. Scripture says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14, 1. Psalm 53, 1. And so the world has become foolish in this. Science, so-called, has offered another view, and our world worships science as an idol. I'd like you to look at a New Testament passage with me from 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm just going to read a couple of verses of it, but I think the whole thing is so prophetic of our time. 2 Peter 3, beginning at verse 3. It says, Knowing this first of all, that scoffers will come. They will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. There's one phrase in particular there. 
that I want to underline. Peter says that people deliberately overlook the fact of creation. Another translation says that they are willfully ignorant of this truth. Mark Mason's translation is they are dumb on purpose. God is the former. He is the maker, the creator. You know, one reason that is so important to believe is because if God is our creator, then it's just logical that we are accountable to him. If we have someone personal who made us, then we answer to him. He can make the rules, and and we need to follow and obey, or we need to answer for not doing so. One person explained it this way. He said, if we will never acknowledge that we are creatures who are ultimately responsible to a creator, we'll never be able to see that we are sinners in need of a savior. It starts with, the fact of creation, you see. This all relates to the gospel. You ever wonder why today, why it seems that so many people can't understand that they are sinners in need of Jesus? Maybe it's because they don't believe they have a creator that they have to answer to and that they're responsible to. Everything changes when you believe that Instead of being created by God, you are evolved from goo. All you are really responsible for if you evolved from goo is yourself. In fact, what's really happened is you have become your own God. And a lot of people are just satisfied with that. God, though, is the former. Next in this outline is that Satan is the deformer. Satan is the deformer. Everything that God made, Satan wanted to twist and destroy, including you and me, by the way. We being the high point of God's creation, you better believe Satan wants to destroy us. The first major turning point of the Bible is Genesis chapter 3. It's really a pivotal passage. I I, I think of it as sort of a hinge of the Bible. You take Genesis 3 out and the whole book is changed. But you can't take it out. It's there. It's history. Genesis 3, the opening verses, just listen to what is recorded for us. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was was to be desired to make one wise, She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. The end of chapter 2, if you look at the very last verse of chapter 2, verse 25, it says that, that Adam and Eve were in the garden, that they were naked and unashamed. But by verse 8, of chapter 3, they're so ashamed of their sin that they're hiding from God. 
among the trees of the garden. Why? All because of sin. All because of the influence of Satan, the great deformer. What happened? Well, Satan, the serpent here, took something that was good. Remember, everything had been pronounced good by God as he made it. But he took something that was good, something that God had made, the tree that was in the midst of the garden, and he twisted it into an object of sin. God had placed it there not to be eaten of, but apparently to be admired and enjoyed as, as part of the creation. But the selfish sin of Adam and Eve took something good out of its context and misused it. They ate from it. And that is exactly what Satan has always tried to do to us. That is, to take good things out of the context and, and out of the boundaries in which it was intended by God to be used. And thus it becomes sin. We can make a long list of examples. Things like food. In this case. But other things like worship. Sexuality. Recreation. All good things from God, which when taken out of context, taken out of God's boundaries for their use, become sin. Satan simply wants to twist the good that God has made, and he succeeds when we let him. One of the great problems that philosophers, theologians have studied and debated for centuries is the problem of evil. Where did evil come from? Why is there evil in the world? Why would a good God allow evil in his world? Why do innocent people suffer? Those are the kind of questions people talk about and, and wonder about and have for millennia. But they all have their answer back here in Genesis chapter 3. What is the source of evil? Sin. God made a perfect place. He made the garden. And he placed us there to enjoy it. Our world has now been twisted, deformed. Why is there suffering? Why is there pain, death, disease? Read Genesis chapter 3. The answer is there. God made a perfect place. We messed it up. In fact, look at the end of the chapter. Genesis 3. We have the record there of the first known death in God's creation. This is after the sin and after the curses have been placed on the serpent and on Adam and Eve for their sin. Then we have Genesis 3.21. It says this, The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Do you ever wonder where did the garments of skin come from? Well, same place they come from today. A dead animal, right? The first death. The New Testament says that sin entered the world and death through sin. That is the answer to the problem of evil and suffering. It's not the solution to the problem, but it is the answer. The solution comes in the last part of our outline. 
Jesus. Jesus is the transformer. He's the transformer. This starts actually in Genesis 3 as well. Uh, Look what happens immediately after Adam and Eve sin. You would think this incredible offense against the Creator, that maybe the Creator would destroy them right away. Does he do that? Of course not. Does he give up on them? No. And he doesn't immediately destroy us or give up on us when we sin. Does he go off and leave them to fend for themselves? Absolutely not. What does the text say? Verses 8 and 9. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? What's going on? God is pursuing his fallen creatures in order to bring them back. To bring them back to him and save them. That's what God's about. And then at the end of the chapter, even God kicking Adam and Eve out of the garden is explained as an act of love and mercy. Verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. God didn't want them to live forever in this fallen state of sin and suffering that they had gotten themselves into. He rescues them from that. Many see a reference even to Jesus. If you back up and look at verse 15, when it talks about this coming conflict between him and and Satan in which Jesus, who is the seed of the woman Eve, would crush Satan's head in the end. Remember some of the details of how this plays out from this point? Satan prompts Cain, one of the children, to kill his brother Abel. But God raises up Seth. Genesis chapter 4. Satan is foiled at the flood when God rescues one righteous family, Noah, and and his people in the ark. Genesis 6 through 9. Satan appeared to be on the verge of victory. When Abraham and Sarah had no true heir. But in their old age, God miraculously intervened and gave them a son, Isaac. Genesis chapter 21. Remember that Satan tried to have the infant Jesus killed. But God prevented him from succeeding, Matthew chapter 2. Jesus resisted the temptations of Satan in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 4. And Satan tried and failed again in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26. And then finally, it all culminates, of course, in Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of mankind. There, the defeat of Satan is sealed. 
You have Jesus, a perfect man, the God-man, dying as a sacrifice for sinful men, a sacrifice that is pleasing and acceptable to God. And then he comes out of the tomb on the third day. He is raised. And he changed everything for all time. If people will just come to him, He promises this this transformation, this change, this delivery from sin and its destructive final effects. That's the promise of the good news. We come to him in repentance when we die to ourselves. We come to him in baptism when we are washed in his cleansing blood, and and we're forgiven. And we come to him in faithfulness daily where we live a truly transformed life. Indeed, raised up like Jesus to walk in newness of life. The whole Bible in three chapters. God, the former, Satan, the deformer. Jesus, the transformer. That is our gospel. That's the good news. I hope you have believed it and you've responded to it. If not, today we have another opportunity to do so. And if we can help you in your response to the good news of Jesus, you're invited now to come. Let us stand, let us sing.